Hello, everybody. Welcome to Live Online. My name is Alistair. I'll be your host for today's show. Thank you very much for joining us today. If this is your first time tuning in, thank you very much. Let's uh, let me tell you a little bit about what it's all about. Niche Live Online takes place every Tuesday and Friday here online, and it's an opportunity for you to find out a bit more about the Natural History Museum in London, its wonderful collections, and more importantly, the people that actually work with that collection every day. It's fully interactive as well, so if you have any questions at all during today's show, please uh, do put them in the chat and we will try and get through as many of your questions as we can. Now, today's show is all about jellyfish and to help us understand and find out a bit more about these very strange little animals, I'm joined by one of our curators, Miranda Lowe, who has a real passion for these animals. Thank you very much for joining us, Miranda. Are you there? Yes. Hi, Esther. Uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, it's great to be here. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for coming, Miranda. Um, just to get us started, um, can you tell us a little bit about what your background is at the museum and what you actually do? So um, I'm one of um, the curators that work behind the scenes at the museum in the Darwin Centre. And um, part of my role, there you can see two really great pictures of it. And, and the one, well, on my right um, is looking into a storeroom of our many collections here. And so that's part of my job, what I do at the museum. So as a curator, you look after a lot of the historical specimens and some current ones. And um, so the main groups of collections that I look after in the animal groupings are crustacea. So that's crab, shrimps, lobsters and cnidaria. So some of the cnidarians that I'm going to be talking about today. But as a curator, um, you check on the specimens that are um, preserved um, as part of our wet collections in a very chilled storeroom. And I also have um, dry collections as well. So there are some of the, the crabs and the lobsters preserved dry and whole, and as well as the corals that are dry. And I facilitate research um, for international scientists um, or work with universities um, on particular scientific projects. So it's a case of using our historical collections to inform current um, research and um, conservation practice in terms of the world's oceans and informing policy in terms of um, marine protected areas. So things like that. And then I get to do really fun stuff like this. So I tell everybody <laughs> about what I'm actually doing. So that's the best bit, just sharing my curiosity and enthusiasm with everyone. That's lovely. Well, it's great to have you here and uh, and thank you uh, again for coming along and, and talking to us today. Now, um, jellyfish is quite I think they're animals that a lot of people have heard of, but maybe not necessarily seen. Um, I think certainly coming from my experience, the first time I saw jellyfish were actually washed up on on a beach uh, in the north of Scotland, and they just looked they looked literally like a blob of slime sitting on the sand. Um, yeah. And actually, if I didn't know, I, I might not even have recognised it as being a jellyfish. Is this a group of animals that you? that you've always been interested in? Um, is this something that, you know, it's you're looking after these specimens and is that kind of like a dream come true almost or did it kind of come later in life? Um, well, I'd always have a fascination um, growing up of, of um, sea creatures in general. So it's just, it is it's something that's come a bit later in life, but it's a dream to be able to um, look after a collection like that and to um, get a, you know, deeper insight into the wonders of deep ocean um, nature, as it were, and, and these sea creatures. And also, I'm lucky enough, um, I was when we were all traveling, um, to visit some really great aquariums across the world, and um, some located like, such as um, Monterey Bay Aquarium. It's located alongside uh, the coast of Monterey Bay, and so that's the best thing about it. And um, jellyfish are really um, kind of difficult to keep, and to rear. So um, when you have an aquarium that can do that, it's, some, it's something really amazing. And um, if you're not a, a, a diver or, or a swimmer, to just be able to see these really amazing, graceful um, um, animals is just something to behold. I mean, they're, they're really graceful. They float. Some of them pulsate. Have many sort of different colors, shapes, and forms that I'm really interested in. And I'm also a bit of a photographer as well. So um, I don't do much underwater photography, but just visiting an aquarium gives you that opportunity to take photographs and observe animals um, because 
you know, a lot of the things I look after were um, collected many, many years ago and, uh, and not living anymore. But just, you know, seeing animals living and how they move in full technicolor glory, as it were, is, mm. is such such amazing. So that's why that's why I love them. Although they look really graceful, you know, some of them do have a deadly sting that we'll talk about. A bit they later. do, which I think a lot of people <laughs> will uh, they'll associate with these animals, and we'll we'll talk a little bit later about that. Um, you know, what what actually how that works and and why they why they do that. But yeah, looking at those pictures, they they, they really do have this kind of graceful beauty about them in the water which of course as you say if you're not a diver or you're not at an aquarium you don't you don't really get to see that mm -hmm. uh, in the museum collection um it must be quite a challenge to to preserve something like that because you yeah. know they, they don't have a, a skeleton that holds them together in the in the sense that that we, that we know um how big is our collection actually and, and how do we how do we typically preserve the specimens um, so it's not one of the biggest collections, but it's substantial in terms of um, jellyfish and the jellyfish species, because we, um, you know, there's probably about 200 different species described, different species of jellyfish, and um, so we tend to use the term sort of jellyfish and, and jellies quite quite loosely, but they are classified um under um a major grouping called um or phylum that's called Nidaria and then within that there are several different classes such as Scyphozoa and um Cubozoa um and so we've probably got a good couple of tens of thousands of jars of lots of of specimens uh, of jellyfish and within each jar there could be several you know, one, two, like 10 or even more, depending on the size of the jellyfish. So um, as you can see there, that's a portrayal of, of jellyfish because they are really difficult to preserve. Um, so on this picture that you're seeing is actually some artwork and it, well, one of my favorite, favorite glass artists, a uh, chap called Stefan Dam, and who does works of art of jellyfish in glass and so there you can see them kind of like quite a vibrant and in their true shape and form there but when you're actually preserving the real animal um, they're often kind of like slumped at the bottom of the jar they're preserved in a weak solution preserving fluid called formaldehyde or formalin so it's very weak um, solution because formaldehyde in greater concentrations can be quite toxic. So the building that you're in is all ventilated to kind of cater for um, having those specimens. So it's not harmful for us to kind of work with that kind of collection. Um, but that um, preserving fluid actually preserves the tissues much better than, you know, I would say 95% of our collections are preserved in some um, percentage of, of what we call alcohol or um, you know, or denatured alcohol, as it were. Um, but but some of the jars within my collection, even though I said that some might be slumped in the bottom of the jar and not look so um, charismatic and uh, or, or glamorous, as it were, but um, some are actually hung um, inside the jar. So um, some of the um, older style jars have a hook, in the, an internal hook. Um, inside the lid of, of the jar. And so they, they've been hung, the jellyfish have been hung either sometimes with um, fishing wire that makes it quite invisible. And then they can hung, hang quite gracefully within, within that jar. So you can actually show them and put them on display. Yeah. Of course, and I guess it makes it easier to do a quick identification as well if you can see some of the features when it's yeah, in, in but the there jar. is that. Although because they're gelatinous, you know, jelly-like, just by their name, um, animals, it's quite they're quite difficult to study. So sometimes you might have to stain them to see particular organs of the jellyfish. Or when you're um, because I, I mentioned that they're preserved in formaldehyde, when you're going to examine more closely or dissect a jellyfish under a microscope, you would take them out of the formaldehyde at a ventilated workspace so that um, the toxic fumes of the formaldehyde are taken away from the laboratory. And then you pop the jellyfish into distilled water. So you'd actually work in a safe environment with the jellyfish under the microscope in distilled water, and then you'd pop it back into its jar mm. of preserving fluid afterwards. So, yeah. Fantastic, excellent. Well, we've, you've, you've touched on this um, briefly already, but I think um, it's, it's worth uh, clarifying for people that are, that are watching that, you know, we call them jellyfish, but they are absolutely not fish are they they, they, are they couldn't fish. be more different in some <laughs> respects now um you mentioned um that they're part of a group called nidarians um could you tell us um you know what 
what what exactly does that mean? And because there are other organisms that people will certainly have heard of that the jellyfish are actually quite closely related to. Yeah. So um, jellyfish are in the major group called my my daria, and part of that group that so let's say that the cousins of jellyfish, as it were, the relatives of jellyfish, are corals. They've got beautiful picture of a coral reef there, and of sea anemones as well. So they're related in the sense that. Um, um, jellyfish in terms of their, their life cycle produce polyps and and corals do and I always tell um, young people that um, uh, the, the polyps that are within so if you look closely at a specific coral um, while it's living you'll see these fleshy organisms a bit like the sea anemone picture that we've got on screen now so I always tell people that it's like a mini sea anemone with, within or across the whole surface of a coral are these fleshy organisms called polyps that have little tentacles that stick out and those polyps are the feeding mouths of a coral or a coral reef um, because those tentacles actually capture passing food on the coral. So that's how, you know, they're related in some way to one another, the sea and enemies, the corals and the jellyfish. So, yeah, so that's really beautiful. One and there. what are some of the, the key differences between them? So I, I get obviously just to look at the, uh, there's, uh, they, they don't look identical. But when you start yeah. looking at the detail, there's a few differences, aren't there? Yeah, it, well, there are um, because... Well, jellyfish, just by the name, they're, they're jelly-like gelatinous. Um, their body is 95% water, whereas a, a coral, um, you, can, you can get, you know, soft coral, but, you know, you have hard corals and they are, you know, more cal calcareous, you know, they're, they're hard, they're harder, um, more harder bodied. Um, so as you can see here, that's a dissection through um, the main bell of, um, of a let's say a common moon jellyfish as it were um and so you what you have central to the animal itself you have a mouth and an anus or a bottom all in one so it feeds and it poos all all through the center um of of its body and then surrounding it on the outside and people may be familiar with moon jellyfish you know you have a frill of of organs around it and those are the tentacles um, that they use that have have stinging cells and so forth and then you might see down the center some other frilly type organs and those are known as um, and they're much thicker than the tentacles that surround that um, and they call all arms there but um, yeah so it's as I said earlier it's quite you know um, difficult to actually see the structures um, mm. unless you stain them up to see you know um, the different parts and what they look like and actually if you're looking from above in terms of a moon jellyfish you'll you'll see the sexual organs the gonads too from the surface excellent so yeah it's something you have to to, to really start to look closely at if you're going to be able to to kind of spot yeah. these, these features now exactly. some people may have encountered um some animals that look a lot like jellyfish but crucially they're not do you want to tell us a little bit about those before we before we move on because I must admit, for a long time, I just assumed these were jellyfish as well. We've got we've got a picture we can show. I'm sure people will will recognise these uh, if they haven't yeah. seen them in real life. They'll certainly have seen them in in books and things. Yeah, well, th this is actually to kind of bring forth. Um, we all use um, to to kind of um, uh, make the public aware of things in general. So I've used the term kind of jellyfish and jellies all sort of interchangeably and so mixed up in that common term that we might all use in terms of jellies but people might see this organism as as a jelly as a jellyfish but it's not actually a true jellyfish so this is um a portuguese man of war there again i'm using another common name and a uh, siphonophore this is part of the siphonophore group of jellies and and this is a colonial animal so it's many organisms in one but what most people will recognize is the the top part of it which you would sometimes see if it was in 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 sea in water you'd see the um the bell of the jellyfish so that is filled with gas that is the bit that allows it to float and move about in the ocean there and um, this one, unfortunately, has beached, has come into land on the beach. And um, 
wouldn't survive unless the tide came in to take it back out because I said earlier they're 95 percent water they're, they're they're invertebrates so they don't have a backbone and these organisms need to be supported by and within water to, to actually live of course yeah which is why as I was saying earlier when I saw some that were dead on a beach they they just kind of looked like blobs of jelly or slime on the yeah. sand and yeah look, looked a bit sad but as we saw earlier they look stunning when they're in the water in their in their natural habitat of course mm. um okay we've had a few questions coming through so um let's uh, let's uh, see if you can uh, help us out with some of these uh, miranda so um thank you very much guys for your questions do keep them coming we'll get through as many of them as we can uh, so the first question here this comes from uh, natalie uh, natalie's asking do we know why the box jellyfish fish is so dangerous and and why does vinegar help with the pain <laughs> um, I don't know if you're speaking from experience, Natalie. Uh, <laughs> I hope you haven't been stung by a box jellyfish. That wouldn't oh, be very I nice. I wouldn't particularly. Um, I mean, there is this thing that goes around that vinegar or um, lemon juice or peeing on a sting. I wouldn't advise that. And I have actually spoken in the last couple of months um, to a doctor about this, and they wouldn't advise that either. I think maybe people might use something in an emergency situation, but I would say if you, well, obviously got that sting, you know, just coming, uh, it, being swimming in the sea and cut and coming out of that, maybe um, douse it in a bit of um, salt water. But sometimes if you put too many of other chemicals on top of something with the sting as well, you're making that chemical reaction. You might be making that embedding that sting and the pain increasing that making it worse so the best thing is to to get to hospital as as soon as possible but I can't remember Alistair what was the other part of oh, why a box jellyfish is so well, yeah I mean, a lot of people I guess will have heard of the box jellyfish because it is it is particularly dangerous why is deadly that? um well um I would say that the, the smaller jellyfish is the smaller the more deadly um I have a colleague, um, Ronald Jenner, that has investigated this quite quite a bit, and he does a lot of work on it. I wouldn't say that's my most detailed level of study, but Ronald, in fact, I've had calls to confer to Ronald for another inquiry about venom and stings. So he does a lot of work around that. But um, yeah, that is in one of top of nature's most deadliest as well. Um, mm. And as I say, you need to get to hospital as soon as possible should that happen. I, I would say also that um, it's a bit like sharks that get a bad name, but um, despite the, the jellyfish having that, you know, venomous sting and it's really deadly, but not all jellyfish sting. Um, so it would say there's kind of like a, a graduation of different types of jellyfish have different levels of sting. And we know about the box jellyfish, but there is um, a, a non-toxic, um, a jellyfish called the golden jellyfish, um, quite a biggish um, jellyfish that that doesn't sting as well. And um, because jellyfish are related to corals and sea anemones, they have a, um, a stings in the, on their um, polyps on the on the tentacles there too. So some corals have a have a mild sting, um, but um, there is and people will be used to seeing the the clownfish. Um, you know, images of the clownfish mm. within a, a, a coral reef or within a, a sea anemone's tentacles, and they have a mucus on their on the surface of their scales that allows them to kind of live and move around that that kind of um, environment. Um, but they they don't have it; um, they're protected from the sting of anything else there. So yeah, yeah. now a good job. Otherwise, they, <laughs> they wouldn't be uh, very comfortable in in there. I think. Uh, excellent. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. And we've got another one. This uh, question's come from uh, Camella. They're asking, um, hey, Miranda, I'd love to know, are there any jellyfish in the Caribbean? Do you have any in your collections? There are some jellyfish from the Caribbean. Um, oh, gosh, and now the name escapes me. It's typical when someone asks you. Um, but we do. I mean, our, our collection and the thing is, I can never see everything about my collection um, no matter how, you know, I'm always seeing something new when I open the cupboard doors or you never have time to investigate everything. But we have um, a wonderful um, a database that we're populating with all this information that people can search on to find where different types of jellyfish are from all over the world. But one thing about jellyfish, they are um, there are animal 
um, species group that have survived for over 500 million years. They are the oldest multicellular animal on the planet. Um, and so they can be found, different species of jellyfish can be found in oceans all around the world. But yeah. So they've done very well in that respect. They have, yeah, yeah. As long as we look Excellent. after our oceans, they'll continue to do so. <laughs> Excellent. Well, let's, I wanna move on and talk a little bit about their, their life cycle because they mm -hmm. are, fascinating in terms of how they actually reproduce and, and go through their life cycle. So I wonder if you could talk us through that that process, because one of these are animals that go through quite a transformation, don't they? Yes, I mean, um, we're all familiar with the, like, the mature kind of jellyfish form that we see, so is in the top left hand um, corner of the, of the image. And um, as I said earlier, you know, for um, what we're looking at here is a kind of form of moon jellyfish, as it were. Um, so um, if you were looking at the jellyfish bell from above, you'd see um, kind of like a leaf shape um, organ or set of organs which carry eggs and sperm and they get released into the ocean to be fertilized. And, and then you get like a, a free swimming larval form um, as the next stage, and and that larvae will will move about in in the currents until it finds um, a hard surface to kind of establish itself and start to mature and grow. And I was talking um, a bit earlier about um, polyps and what they look like, and what you can see in um, section four of this image are the different stages and forms of um, the 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 larvae maturing into a polyp, which will then bud off and then develop into becoming um, a young um, jellyfish form. So as you can see here, there's lots of, you know, different different shapes before a jellyfish actually reaches maturity. And do we know how long that process takes to go through it one be, cycle? It would be different. It would be um, variable of a different species. And one of the things um, in terms of um, knowing that and monitoring it is that um, for a lot of deep ocean science, it takes a long time and very costly to do those observations over time. So you will be, and um, you know, the London Aquarium, and I'm, I'm sure um, the aquarium in Plymouth are doing a lot of long-term study, actually rearing some of these jellyfish. As I said earlier, they're quite difficult, quite sensitive animals. And what you can see there is um, a kind of elongated um, polyp that um, will eventually bud off to make um, an immature um, jellyfish. Um, but it involves a lot of long-term observations and timing and knowing when, you know, each species, and there are different environmental conditions in the ocean that might affect species in terms of um, their reproduction as well. Mm. Um, so it's constant mo monitoring and, you know, it's change over time, yeah. Yeah, they certainly, when we look at some of the pictures, they they they, they look beautiful, but they also do seem really fragile. I was just, which, a, um, I was just about to say that, yeah. Yeah, and which was so lead me on to my next question, was about basically how, how long, how long can a jellyfish survive for, assuming it's not eaten by something else? And we've yeah, actually yeah. also had um, a question come in. Uh, this is a question from Debbie. Uh, they're asking, I've heard that the Turritopsis jellyfish are immortal. Yes. Is that true? And if so, how do they do it? So we've got on the one hand, this idea that they might be really fragile. And on the other mm. hand, these are animals that seemingly might, some of them might live forever. How does this, how yeah, do we well, work? Yeah, well, this again involves long-term study to actually know that. And um, there may be other people across the world, but I know there's a guy in Japan that has been doing this for, for years, if not decades, a couple of decades. And um, so that's how we found out about Chiratopsis. And um, what's interesting about this, as we say, it regenerates. But this jellyfish, I mean, the, the photography here is amazing. It makes it look like really alien-like and, you know, like it's in um, the outer space of the ocean, as it were. And um, this is only the size of a pea. It's about one centimetre and it's got a thimble shape. And you sort of think, God, to, you know, we might be distracted by really larger jellyfish and observing them. But sometimes the tiniest things such as this can inform our science about these animals so much. And um, so it does, they're called the process um, transdifferent, 
pronunciation. I hope I've got that right. A bit of a tongue twister. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's right. A big word for a small animal, tiny yeah. animal. And um, so what it's uh, what happens that when um, so like most jellyfish, they would die or any other animal, they would decay and degenerate. Um, what happens is that there's some kind of signal that picks up in the in the cells of this jellyfish. And um, those jellyfish start to rejuvenate, start to reform into um, a new polyp colony. So we were looking at um, the polyps earlier in the other life cycle. And that's what happens. So some kind of signaling process happens within the cell that kick in to allow it to start reproducing with itself, reforming again for the polyps to um, um, develop and then they would bud off to create new jellyfish and so you know it's it's a regeneration process it's um yeah it's, it's that's a, incredible it's, and it, I guess really, the, really like I guess that would be in kind of normal conditions it's not going to die of old age in that sense but of course it can still I mean we've, we've had one question come in uh, from YouTube about does anything eat jellyfish you know I guess you can have an, an, an theoretically an immortal animal but it can still be Attack. Yes, it can still be eaten, it, it, I guess. It, yeah, it can still be eaten. So this is in perfect ideal conditions where it where it isn't, and then you know it can have you know lots of its own colonies, like most animals, if they're not affected by anything external that would do them harm, such as human beings or um, other predators, then yeah, they, they will survive. But obviously, it it can get eaten. There are sort of you know other fish, other animals, other turtles that will eat jellyfish. Um, so course. yeah. So now one thing that uh, they they also you know we talk about how vulnerable they can sometimes look. One of the things that we see we talked about them moving so gracefully through the water. Mm -hmm. Are jellyfish at the mercy of the ocean around them and the currents, and they're just carried where the current goes, or do they have the ability to actually move around, you know, independently, as it were? They can do a bit of both. So most jellyfish might be gracefully gliding um, in terms of the ocean currents. Some migrate at, uh, um, according to um, the sun as well um, and, and the light intensity. And what we can see there, I think that's, um, if I've got my jellyfish correct, that's a lion's mane one. Someone might correct me online. But this one is showing that it's pulsating. So the kind of like... Um, the muscles um, um, uh, in the bell of the jellyfish are contracting and expanding to cause a, a pulsation. And then you're also using their oral arms to, to help with that as well. So that's a really nice. Um, yeah, that. from those images, they look like quite effective at, yeah. at moving around there. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you mentioned mm -hmm. you, you reckon that was a, a lion's main jellyfish. Um, you think so, so we, someone we've, well, we've, someone's <laughs> asked about it um so <laughs> apologies if it's not i'm not the expert on it at all either but um, <laughs> we've had a question um uh, do you know why there's been such a huge increase of lion's mane jellyfish in northern ireland um so i wasn't aware that happened but um oh I don't know neither if... was I, so someone's on the ball oh wow <laughs> wow so lion's mane jellyfish they um have the I think the longest I think their their tentacles and um, all arms can be um, about thirty six meters um, if I've got my um, numbers right but that's um, well wow I didn't know that I'm going to have to investigate that afterwards <laughs> um, amazing um, but again um, you know we talk about climate change and and currents and temperatures of the oceans that could be um, a, uh, the reason why one of the re many reasons why but also there are issues with um overfishing um um uh, did this person say they they stranded in large numbers well they just said that they there seem to be a lot there so i'm not sure if they mean oh, on a lot the beach there or, in the yeah. pool, right oh so we don't know if they've been has been a massive stranding but they've observed a lot in in those waters mm. um well again to do with currents and finding food um food resources things like that mm. um could be multiple things but that's an interesting one yeah no well. so we, we will look into that oh. that's uh, a good yeah. point and <laughs> i don't know if this this question might relate to actually this is one from uh, stefania they're asking how does water pollution affect jellyfish so i don't know if you know if, if there's a local event that causes the water to become badly polluted i, I that must have an effect on them too in terms of numbers oh, definitely or, because 
definitely um, in terms of numbers that would get depleted, they'd get stranded on the beach, they'd, they'd essentially die. They're very sensitive to chemical changes and imbalances because if you've got an organism that um, um, is 95% relying on water, they're, they're going to be affected by any kind of ke chemical change um, in the salinity of the water. Um, so, Harley, we're talking about fragility in, in that sense as well. And so that's mm. why we all have to be mindful of what we are putting into the oceans and what gets trapped. You know, yeah. we, we talk a lot about plastics as well and plastics degrading in the oceans, giving all, you know, um, um, polluting in terms of the chemical breakdown. Of well, we had a question too. about that, actually, um, mm. uh, about do, do jellyfish actually ingest microplastics um, and does this impact their health? I so imagine the answer to that is almost certainly yes. I imagine they do because there are other animals that I work on. So I mentioned um, uh, crustaceans. So there are tiny um, animals, um, I call them just for the sake of common shrimpy-like things, but they're known as amphipods. And there have been um, programs more recently showing that, so these amphipods were the, the smallest you can, you know, you can get, it's, um, you know, um, sort of under one centimeter, but really tiny organisms that are affected by the plastic pollution that you're, you're finding the microplastics within these animals. So definitely within jellyfish, you know, it's it, plastic pollution um, is affecting all animals, no matter what size. Mm. They're either getting, you know, seeing turtles getting trapped in bits of plastic items of debris and things, or the breakdown plastics of too much of that in our ocean also is affecting um, our animals. So every, every which way, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I think this is going to be an issue that Unfortunately, we're going to be talking about more and more and more in the years ahead because it's not going yeah. away uh, anytime yeah. soon. And um, so, yeah, thank you very much, guys, for your questions. We've got loads of them. I'll try and get through as many as we can, um, as well as looking at some of the beautiful photography that we've we've got of the jellyfish as well. Um, I want to just pick this question. This one um, sort of ties into the point I want to mention next, Miranda. This one uh, is a question from Megan. Uh, they're asking, what is the most colorful jellyfish? Um, now you mentioned earlier that they're they're often not very colourful, but I did want to ask you about yeah. bioluminescence because that's mm. definitely something that I've seen jellyfish do, and that seems to bring a whole lot of colour into the ocean, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think that image that we that we're seeing there might be some jellyfish that are having a green light shone on them. On them, but, they're not making um, that themselves. But yeah, because um, in certain aquariums you can do that with that. Those are uh, moon jellyfish, or I suspect they're Aurelia or Rita um, uh, jellyfish. But in terms of, but that, that just gives an example of what bioluminescence is. And it's like a chemical reaction um, that happens within the, the cells of the jellyfish that produces um, light, emittance of light. And so there's some wonderful, um, um, you know, deep ocean sort of um, film footage with various um, jellyfish and other jelly-like animals known as um, tenophores as well, that you can see um, like um, a, a light show, strips of lighting on the surface of them of many different colours. And there are um, jellies known as Oh gosh, what are they called now? Um, Periphyla anatola um, jellies, um, and um, they will use this bioluminescence, light emittance, um, to um, either flashing or um, kind of like a series of, of lights going across the animal to ward off predators, and sometimes um, that light emitt emittance is used to disguise them as other plankton in the ocean so that predators don't eat them. So it's a warning as well as um, I look like something else that you shouldn't be eating. So yeah. don't eat me kind of thing. And it could also be, be used. Um, so there are st some studies in terms of communicating to other jellyfish species as well. So um, yeah, that's what they use. Go ahead. And, you know, I hadn't really thought about that because I have to say, mm. I've not really considered their intelligence very much in this. Um, yeah, well, uh, jellyfish don't have any brains, um, but there are other ways, um, you know, in the ocean of communicating. Um, there are, we were talking about the box jellyfish um, earlier on, and um, that has, um, so it's been found that box jellyfish have 
eyes, but not eyes in the true sense. They have four eyes, so at four corners, it's a box jellyfish, so that's a kind of general shape. And um, um, in terms of those being cells that um, use light in some way, yeah, there we can see the, the dark spots around the corners there, yeah. Okay, so those dark spots are actually... Or is it, oh eyes. gosh, wait, hold on, uh, might not be the dark spots, it might be on the upper bit that there's kind of greenish bits yeah. that are yeah. the circular greenish bits around it, <laughs> but they're on the four corners anyway, so, and they're not true eyes in the sense that how, how we see, but, you know, kind of some kind of light receptors sense, that are sensitive to light. Mm -hmm. Now, well, actually, while we're on the box, jellyfish, um, we mentioned earlier um, that a lot of people think of jellyfish, they think of the sting. And of course, the box jellyfish here is is regarded as probably the most dangerous uh, in terms of, you know, you, you, you can die from uh, from being stung by these. You did mention that not all jellyfish sting. Yeah. And we did get a question on this uh, from Peter. Um, and they asked, is that because they don't have the stinging cells or is it just that the cells can't... Um, penetrate the the human skin that now that is that is definitely a really good question and i know a person to ask i don't actually uh, i don't actually know the answer to that question for the golden jellyfish um i'm just trying to go through <laughs> how many papers have i read <laughs> but, um, <laughs> we're putting you on but, the spot here aren't we no, but no, that's really good because sometimes those those are the best questions because you don't know everything about everything. There is so much to know, um, and I'm constantly um, reading scientific papers or in touch with colleagues that do um, more in depth detail into a particular species. Mm. Um, so that is a really good question, and I know uh, a person to ask. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, um, yeah, we, so we don't know at this point. But while we're here, why don't we take a look at how the, how this thing would work? Because it's oh, quite yeah. an interesting mechanism, isn't it? Um, mm. So maybe you can talk us through because it's it's sort of like a it, it, like a harpoon almost, isn't it? That, yes, that yes, shoots. it is. That's, and that, that's and that, right. when you get stung, that has to go through your skin, and that's what that's what makes you come up in a rash, doesn't it? That, that's it. So um, on the along the um, jellyfish tentacles. Um, in, embedded within that structure of a tentacle will be um, the stinging cells um, and that's why certain jellyfish are known as stingers more than others but um, you can see in the first picture on the left hand side where the trigger is so that's like a switch that basically if another animal or human being um, sort of brushes along the tent surface of the tentacle where that trigger is it flips the lid and what comes out you can see there there's a coiled um, um, stinging cell that gets released um, the harpoon and then in it say in terms of a box jellyfish that venom will will go through um that harpoon and that stinging cell into and injected into your body and then that's and then we can see the damage that this can do i'm sure if anyone's watching that's been swimming uh, or mm -hmm. divers have maybe experienced this is you can get maybe not something as deadly if it's not like the box jellyfish but you can get a, a quite a nasty sort of yeah. rash over the part yeah. of your body that's come into contact with these yeah i mean i you know it depends you know um as i said stings are to a greater or lesser extent but if you're a highly um sensitive person such as myself i i had suffer from allergies then um <laughs> i may come up in a more of a, a rash than somebody else that has a slight rash but um it's never it's never good all the same so you should get it treated yeah, yeah. Oh. We've we've got a picture we can show people. If if you're a bit squeamish, um, close your eyes for the next few seconds. Yeah. Uh, but we we'll, we can show you the sorts of thing you can yeah. expect. So yeah, it, yeah. It, it comes up as a kind of bad rash, I suppose. I, I don't know yeah. if you know what a particular jellyfish um, did this. Um, no, I'm guessing it's life threatening to see, not to take a picture. But. Yeah. And and sometimes you'll you'll see like a, a bit like more of a whiplash um, kind of trace as well, sort of long lines too, but there's quite a big patch in, in that um, part of the central image there. Yeah. All right, well, um, we've got a couple more questions. Um, I'll just pause there for a second and we'll get a few more of these. So um, this is an interesting question I hadn't really considered. This one's uh, come from Donna. Uh, they're asking, can jellyfish camouflage like an octopus? Um, that is an interesting question. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, 
I've never really thought about it in that way. Um, well, um, well, they put on their, their warning signal through a bioluminescence and flashing to deter predators. And when I said, you know, that the um, bioluminescence can be used to, well, I suppose it is a kind of camouflage, um, disguising in a way that they look like other plankton in the ocean. So don't eat me. That is a camouflage in a way. But don't you? never really used the term camouflage for jellyfish so much but it's mm. but it's quite used extensively for um for octopus um yeah yeah mm. i wonder if um because they're uh, if they're not bioluminescent you know we, we we talked earlier about how they often are quite colorless and you said it's, it's quite yeah, difficult it's sometimes if you're way. studying the body parts to kind of see them because they're transparent so i guess yeah, it's not so much the camouflage cam sometimes they're almost invisible in the they're water invisible, yeah so it's an invisibility rather than a, a camouflage that is applied to jellyfish <laughs> a lot more of the time i think yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's an interesting question thank you yeah uh, it really is <laughs> um now something I, I want to talk about is mainly because we've got a really great image we could show people um jellyfish blooms are are a thing aren't they um yeah. can you tell us exactly how, how like what are they and how do they how big can they get how do they come about because when um, they happen they can be quite a, a spectacular sight can't they yeah you can see so those are um um some jellyfish that have bloomed um they're in the because that's quite a famous picture um so it's the giant jellyfish let me get the name right uh nemo palma um i think um and um that's in the sea of japan and that's not helpful to the fishing industry um um, and, and sometimes those blooms are caused because of overfishing as well. So that the natural predators of the jellyfish um, might eat some of the larvae to control the population. So that, but because it's overfished, you don't have those natural predators there. So then you get um, jellyfish kind of growing to their full extent and in, in, in vast numbers as well. Um, it's also, um, because of coastal constructions. We were talking about earlier um, climate change and the, um, uh, the chemistry of the ocean changing as well. Um, so, and what happens here that there's a shift in the um, natural ecosystem. So these jellyfish blooms have happened. As I say, there are no fish to eat their larvae. So what's happening, the shift in the ecosystem. So instead of being loads of fish, there are less fish, but there's more jellyfish instead. Mm. Um, so multiple things, but they're not great for the um, fishing industry. So um, if that's you've got a situation, to be mindful. Yeah, and if you've got a situation like that, where you've got, like we saw in that picture, that bloom that, and it's affecting fishing, mm. is there an industry that fishes jellyfish? Do people eat jellyfish, for example? Is that something they, that happens? They do um, in Southeast Asia, in, in, in China. I've actually visited China and seen it on the menu, <laughs> um, but I didn't try it. Um, so, yes, um, you can have jellyfish and stir fry, um, sort of powdered ground jellyfish in sweets as well. But I've not tried any of it. <laughs> I think have we got some images of it. Yeah, I think um, I imagine um, I've never tried it myself. If any of you have tried it, um, put it in the comments and, and let us know. I'd be uh, curious to know. But there we go. Um, yeah, yeah. I, in my head, I imagine it having um, a kind of texture similar to something like squid or something, maybe softer yeah. than that. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how it will be an extremely delicate flavour. So it might be um, more the flavour of the sauce that is infused within the stir fry or something um maybe not as a powerful um uh flavor as as a squid or, or octopus no doubt but i've yeah. never tried so. well, i might give if i come across it i might give it a go and i'll let you know miranda what, what i think right um, yes send in the i'm report. sure it'll be heavily seasoned with some chili and, <laughs> and sauce and things as well. but while we're on the topic of food actually um there's been a re there's some really strange experiments done uh, with mm. some jellyfish, and there's one in particular in relation to peanut butter, um, yeah. which I know you you've um, talked to me about before. Do you want to um, tell our audience a little bit about that? Well, um, it was an interesting experiment or paper that I I came across. Now I can't remember if it was a laboratory in Texas, 
it might have been, but it was an American laboratory um, where some students were um, doing an experiment to see how quickly, and we were talking about earlier, you know, how long do jellyfish live and their life cycle? Well, all of these, you need this long-term observation. So mm -hmm. some um, uh, jellyfish um, larvae were being grown in this laboratory, and one was in ordinary seawater, so that I've seen that was the control experiment. And then um, in the other experiment with um, the young jellyfish, were rearing them in a solution of seawater and peanut butter. Um, so, and, and and what happened was that um, the jellyfish larvae that were in the peanut butter solution grew twice as fast. And I can only assume that's because there's an added extra protein from um, the peanut butter within that solution. But it's just interesting the kind of experiments you can do um, and I assume they got funding for it as well <laughs> to try that out, which is really something that you might take for, for granted, um, you know, peanut butter that, that we have and um, mm. is nutritious for us and has protein peanuts. I was but... say, if you want to grow big and strong, apparently, have, have your peanut butter. <laughs> if you're not allergic, of course. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. Good. That's well, true. Unfortunately, uh, Miranda, we have run out of time today, but wow. it's been so great um, to, to chat to you about these animals and, and, and learn a bit more about them. I think um, you've certainly um, enlightened me a bit more on, on, on them because as I say, my experience of them has been uh, rather unfortunately seeing them on the beach uh, after they've, they've been washed up. So it's, it's really great to hear a bit, more, uh, a bit more about them. So thank you very much for that. And um, all the best uh, uh, as you get back, uh, back to the collections. Yeah, thank you. All right, bye everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs> And thank you guys as well for all your questions. Sorry if we didn't get to yours specifically. Hopefully we answered most of them uh, during the course of our conversation. It's always great to, uh, to have you guys involved uh, and, uh, and putting our scientists on the spot there and asking them uh, all your questions. Thank you very much for that. If you enjoyed the show and you want to uh, find out more about our collections and our research um, at the Natural History Museum in London, then these shows are running every Tuesday and Friday. So do join us again next time. It's a different topic every day. Um, so you never know, um, we might be taking your favourite animal for a spin next time. But thank you very much for joining us today and we'll see you again very soon.